we're live already. I just got this up so we can start drawing some people. One sec, sorry. Link, so. Uh, Say that again, sorry. Got me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. What'd you say? I said, uh, we're live already. I'm just. I wanted oh, to get. Okay. The, I wanted to get the link out so I could. Nope. No problem. All right. There we go. There we go. Create a. Create a banner here. Wit's going to address the media this morning at 10.45. So yeah. I'm guessing you'll be on there. Oh, yeah. I will be on there. I just <laughs> got that email. Yeah, I'll be on there. I'm shuffling meetings as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking A. All right. Tuesday. Sorry. Well, I forgot we're live. Yeah. What anyway. The hell? Yeah. Uh, Tuesday at 1040. Tuesday at uh, 745 to announce the move. <laughs> Seems like a good time. Seems like as good a time as any, right? Yeah, yeah, as good a time as any. If anybody's already on this, they they got a uh, peak mic there. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and run with this, and then we'll uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, good morning, everyone. Paul Van Wagner, Mike McDaniel on the Voice of College Football Virginia Tech page. Um, the news breaks this morning, as Mike said at. Uh, about 7.44 a.m. is when I got the official press release from Virginia Tech's athletic department. Whit Babcock announces that Justin Fuente and the athletic department have mutually agreed to part ways and that a national search is underway to fill the position of head football coach at Virginia Tech. J.C. Price will serve as interim head coach for the remainder of the season. And Mike, see that one coming. Now I did, yeah, <laughs> there's so much to unpack, and that's kind of the first thing I want to go to. But yeah. that seems like the the least important of all of the uh, of all of the details here. Um, this does not come as a surprise to anyone. I'm sorry, I got to mute my phone. It's all good. Um, uh, this does not come as a surprise to anyone, I don't think. Um, Trey, Trey Lyle. <laughs> Trey Lyle jumping in. Mike, um, I like your background of storage. Thank you. Yeah, Thank hey, you, Trey. It's his garage. Yeah, it's his garage. Yeah. My yeah. garage. Um, no, no shock here, right? Like this is – we, we all saw this coming. I think we all thought it was either going to happen – last December, which the coaching carousel, nothing was moving because of COVID, or we thought because of the buyout that it was going to happen December 15th of this year. Yeah. But nah, Tuesday, November 16th, coming off of a victory against Duke, middle of the week, Miami ready, you know, down in Miami, a, a must-win game if you want to get bowl eligible. We'll fire our coach now. This seems like a good a time as any, Mike. Yeah. I'm, my initial thoughts this morning were like, why are we doing this on a Tuesday morning? Why didn't we do right? this on Sunday morning or, or Monday? And so many theories out there. I, I tweeted out that I was surprised by the timing. I Because I am. I'm genuinely surprised that they decided to do this on a Tuesday morning. Uh my thought, and it's very funny because now my mentions are filled with everybody's theories as to why it happened today. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's well, been I, I'm curious. Please share. Right. So my thought is that this has been in the works for a while. So let me start with this. Yep. 
I said, and I've been on the record on podcasts and your show and the pregame show on, on ESPN Blacksburg and, and on this site, I've been on the record with saying that I thought that they would wait until the 15th to formally fire Fuente. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't have something worked out in the background, which clearly they did. That doesn't mean that Whit Babcock wouldn't start looking for a new head coach before the 15th, because I thought that he would. Uh, but I was on the record saying it wouldn't happen until the 15th because Virginia Tech would be trying to save the two and a half million dollars on his buyout. Now, sure. right. what we don't know is the mutual parting of ways, what that entails contractually. Yes. So I didn't take that into account. I kind of thought about that with December 15th in mind, mm -hmm. early signing day period, big key, uh, bingo, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to get ahead of it. You want to give it the new coach an opportunity to come in and try to retain some of this class, right? Because you are going to lose guys. Guys are going to decommit over the next few days. They're going to, they're going to say, I'm reopening my recruitment regardless of who the head coach is, right? Because Virginia right. Tech isn't going to hire their head coach tomorrow. I don't think uh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll be surprised. Maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, but I think what my, my reasoning why, as to why this happened on Tuesday morning, and maybe we'll get clarity and like an actual answer on this, is that Virginia Tech and Justin Fuente, they've been working on this for a little, a little while. Right. You know, maybe after the Syracuse game or BC or, you know, they've been working on this for a little while, a mutual parting of ways where they agree to separation terms, right? Yep. And Virginia Tech and Fuente's agent came to an agreement and finalized it this morning. That's my theory. Or, or late last night so they can get all the PR stuff in order. That's just my thought on it. Uh, this has been in the works. That's that's my thought. Now, I, I think we all, in the Virginia Tech media, we all heard that this had been in the works, that they were planning to part ways, and that it's like a worst-kept secret type thing. Right, right. But, I didn't expect it to happen today. I don't think anybody did. I mean, yeah. there are excellent Virginia Tech reporters like David Teal and Mike Niziolek and Andy Bitter, mm -hmm. and none of them broke this. Nope. None of them broke it. Now, you got, you got to give Virginia had, Tech credit. They, they did a great job of keeping this under wraps. Yeah. Bitter had an article teed up that went out shortly after the press release. So I have a feeling he found out either last night or this morning that was going right. to happen. But point being like Virginia tech kept this under wraps, like the actual day that they would do it. They kept this quiet, which speaks to how wit can work in the background. And we've seen it with yeah. coaching searches before at when he brought Fuente in, you know, uh, arranged that meeting with Bud Foster and middle of the night. And yep. so I, I don't know. This, this also explains kind of that non-answer that Fuente gave in, in the post game. The other day when he was asked about, you know, uh, you know, how you're going to prep for Miami, he just kind of gave a non-answer. It was like, ah, well, you know, we'll see. It was very odd. He didn't really know how to answer it because I think he knew he wasn't going to be coaching. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, or likely wasn't going to be coaching depending on the timing of it. So that part, that whole thing is weird. The other part of this is JC Price being named interim. If this was already in the works, it would explain why he basically quit. Jordan, you know what? I don't think so, but why not? Like, why not? I mean, it fits, right? Like, why not? If the shoe fits, baby. Uh, it's uh, and why he didn't know that Trey Turner was hurt. He knew Trey Turner was hurt. He knew, that that yeah. that he knew that Trey Turner was hurt. That yeah. was he's always that, been boy with media on injuries. That whole thing speaks to a bigger, and I know you you want to get to the J.C. Price thing, and we're going to, yeah. but, I mean, yeah. it speaks to the bigger picture of this whole Justin Fuente era, right? And I'm not I'm not here to bash Fuente. I'm not here to, to, you know, drag him through the mud or anything like that. But the one thing that we saw as media was there was always this feeling of a cloak of secrecy, right, where, where – we're not going to tell you anything, and and we're going to make it really obvious that we're not going to tell you anything. I mean, it, you know, it, it used to, it, it, it still does, I guess. It, it frustrates me on several fronts. You know, you, you would see the beginning of a press conference, and Mike Nizelik, because it's his job, would ask about players that were injured. And Justin Fuente would just give these, no, 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 he's fine. 
kind of answers, you know, and it's like, and then, you know, it got to the point where Fuente would kind of look at Nizalik and he would be like, look, I know it's your job to ask me this, but I'm not going to tell you anything. And it's like, why? Like, what are you trying to hide? Why? Are, and why are you trying to hide it from us? Like, just, just answer the question, you know, is, is did James Mitchell tear up his knee? No, he's fine. He's walking around. And then we find out on Monday that James on Mitchell has Tuesday, to have surgery yeah. because his knee's tore up, right? Like, yeah, you know, right. is, 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 is Trey Turner injured? No, he's fine you know, okay, well, no, he's obviously not. There's something going on, you know, and, and as a fan base, like the, the one thing that I love about Virginia Tech football, Mike, and, and you can speak to this as an alum, is as a fan base, we glom on to these kids, right? Like they're, they're an extension of family to us, and, and, and people just want to know, and, and to have a coach and a coaching staff that that doesn't give you anything, like that's, it, it's just it's frustrating and 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 that whole cloak of secrecy it's something that i never liked from the moment i got here and justin fuente got here about two weeks before i did so we our our time in blacksburg has been running concurrent good news for me i outlived justin fuente how about that uh you will still be in blacksburg so that's true got that got that going for you uh yeah i mean they've been this was a regime that was very coy with the media right and yep. media access was never something that fuente was comfortable with no nope. and you can get away with that at memphis sure you can't, you can't get away with that virginia tech yep. and uh it's just two different two different programs and i think if we were going to chalk up you know one one thing that kind of doomed fuente here like over the course of six years because it wasn't a total <laughs> Trey, i'm not going anywhere buddy y'all are stuck with me it wasn't a total uh Oh man, I lost my train of thought because that was so funny. I'm sorry. Uh, so, oh, okay, okay. The the Fuente regime thing. Uh, if if there was one thing to chalk up, like kind of what failed Justin Fuente in Blacksburg, it was his loyalty to a fault. Like that's my overarching takeaway from oh, yeah, kind of what sure. what can we learn from what happened here over six years? It's that when things started going sideways in 2018 and the first part of 2019, Fuente didn't really make a lot of staff changes. You know. Um, he moved on, like Bud retired after 19. Charlie Wiles uh, was let go. He's now a defensive line coach at NC State. So he made those kinds of changes, but he didn't make like these wide sweeping changes. You know, a lot of people want changes on the offensive staff, didn't happen. Um, instead, what ended up happening was to replace Bud Foster, he hired a first time defensive coordinator in Justin Hamilton, young up and coming coach. I think very highly of Justin Hamilton, but probably not qualified for the position that he was put in. Uh, on the offensive side, you at, at running back, right? You move on from running backs coach. You move on from Zon Burden. He move, he leaves and goes to Maryland, and you promote Adam Lechtenberg, who I like a lot and is a very good recruiter. And he's always been very good to me. He actually he sent me a Twitter direct message like the day I got married <laughs> and said congratulations. Nice right. guy, great great guy. I think very Thank highly you. of him. But you know he had never coached running backs before. <laughs> So it's like, okay, so now we got a running backs coach who's never coached running backs before. We have a defensive coordinator who's never been a coordinator at any level, let alone a power five level. And we have a wide receivers coach in Jafar Williams who is replacing Holman Wiggins, who is now on Nick Saban's staff. So that shows how qualified he was. Yep. And that's before you even get to Brad Cornelson, which is, yep. you know, everybody's scapegoat is Cornelson. So before you even get down that path, there are a number of hires that you look at and you're like, man, from a staff standpoint, that didn't make a lot of sense. Right. Now, Fuente tried to make some changes later, right? Like Daryl Tapp, let, he brought Daryl Tapp in. Then Daryl Tapp left to go to the NFL, which nobody's going to fault him there. Brings in J.C. Price, an alum. Very good move. Had Bill Tierling come in from the NFL. Good move. Um, he made those types of changes. Brought in a young up-and-coming coach from JMU and Ryan Smith who was establishing relationships in Virginia to get Virginia recruiting back on track. Mm -hmm. He made all these other moves that were good moves and Virginia Tech's recruiting class as it sits like going into today, 20th in the country. 20th in the country for 2022. Yep. Yep. A good recruiting class by Virginia yeah. Tech standards, right? Yes. And it was too little too late. 
You know, Virginia Tech had two really bad recruiting classes in a row. They had one that was bad by anybody's standards, the worst in the Power Five two years ago for 2020. Right. Then the 2021 recruiting class finished in the mid-40s nationally. Not going to get it done at Virginia Tech. So that was the wake-up call, but it was a year too late. So I, it's almost like the fireman putting out his own fire, right? Like, are we going to give him credit, you know, or the arsonist putting out his own fire or whatever it is? Right. I, are we going to give him credit for that? Like, no, <laughs> like we we can't, you know, if this is a problem that, that, that you created and then we're too late to fix yep. it, just some of these moves came a year or two too late. And I think that's ultimately what leads to Fuente's downfall. And, and, you know, we can talk about Brad Cornelson as, as the offensive coordinator. Yes. He's set multiple, you know, records uh, as an offensive coordinator, but Brad Cornelson's inability to get the most out of this offense this year is the reason why Justin Fuente is no longer the coach on November 16th. Yeah, that's it, I, everything you've said. I agree with the one point I want to just make, and I don't know that it is a direct correlation, but you look at the coaches that left and where they went. And with the exception of maybe Maryland, who <clears throat> really honestly, Maryland football in the big 10 is an afterthought. Um, every one of them are having more success where they currently are than the Hokies are having right now. And again, I don't know that Charlie Wiles is, is a direct correlation with NC State's success, same deal with Alabama, right. but you're getting rid of coaches that are going to programs that are more successful than the program that you're currently running and you kind of have to, I mean, at some point, right, like you have to take a look in the mirror and say, right, okay, right. what's the common denominator that's causing this issue? And if you can't look in the mirror and say, maybe it's me or maybe it's my best friend that I, for whatever reason, and, you know, and good on him, right? Like, I mean, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, Mike, if you and I are being chased by a bear, I'm tripping your ass because I don't have to run fast. I just have to run faster than you. Uh, like, I'm pretty yeah. sure Justin Fuente is going to pick Brad Cornelson up and carry him, right? Like, I mean. Right. And, and, and best I man guess in his good. wedding. What's that? He's the best, he was the best man in Fuente's wedding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean and good for him. Best right? friend. Like, I yeah. mean, that kind of loyalty in today's age is really hard to come by. Brian Kelly fired his groomsmen. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you just got to. You got to separate personal relationships from business relationships, and sometimes you have to make tough decisions. And I'm you know, making three and a half million time. dollars a year, Mike, and it's me or it's you. It's you, <laughs> right? Right. I love you, man, but yeah. it's you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I and I wouldn't fault you for making the, that decision. I would be making the same one. Like, right. I don't know many people that decisions. wouldn't. And, um, and, and Fuente's being paid, by the way, to, to make yeah. those types of decisions, right? Yeah. That's I think yeah. that's the most disappointing part of this entire thing is like you're getting paid very handsomely by Virginia Tech to the tune of up re-upping your contract twice. Now, if there's anything Whit Babcock can learn from this, right? Because look, when he hired Justin Fuente, this wasn't always a disaster, right? Right. Ten, he wins 10 games in year one. Hokies push Clemson to the brink in the ACC championship game, a game that Clemson, a Clemson nearly lost, and they went on to win the national championship. 2017, nine wins. Could have been 10. They were in a bowl game against a really good Oklahoma State team in the Camping World Bowl. They had Mason Rudolph and all those weapons on the outside. Really good Oklahoma State team. 19 wins in two years. That's no fluke. That's no fluke. Right. Like I don't care who you're inheriting. You got to coach them up, right? You got to coach them up. Sure. What ended up being a bigger issue later on is you lost some, you lost some assistance. Like we mentioned, you lose Bud, you, you lose Holman Wiggins. And now all of a sudden you're having trouble developing talent, right? So the player development part was an issue, but this wasn't always a disaster in Blacksburg. If there's one thing I want Whip Babcock to learn from this entire thing, pay the coach what he's worth the day you sign him. Yeah. The day you sign him. Don't feel like after year one, you have to re-up him. Don't feel like after year two, you have to re-up him and get yourself in this mess with this huge buyout right. where when things start going south, you can't make a change, even if you want to. If, in tw at the end of 2018, he was never going to make a change, right? Because one bad year, 16, 17, 19 wins, one bad year in 18. He was never going to make a change after 18. 19 right. was very up and down. Right. He could have made a change in 19 before the pandemic. Problem is, 
Fuente had a huge buyout at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huge buyout. This buyout went down twelve, uh, two and a half million every year, right? So it was it went right. from fifteen to twelve and a half to ten. Now uh, it was going to drop to seven and a half uh, on the on the fifteenth of December. So don't put yourself in this situation contractually if you're with Babcock with the next hire. That that's yeah. the biggest takeaway I want him to have, and I, I'm sure. What's what's a smart guy, man? Like he's oh, gonna yeah. he's gonna come to come to understand that. But he did what he had to do at the time, and he and I can't fault him either, because when he got here, Virginia Tech was in a much different place financially than it is now. Right. And I get why he felt like he had to make the moves that he was making. And Fuente entertaining the Baylor thing after 2018 tells you everything you need to know, or 2019. I'm sorry, tells you everything that you need to know. So. What a weird tenure. It, it really was. It really was. And, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't even know. I don't even know. It, you're right. right. It was a very weird, weird situation uh, from top to bottom. And it kind of got more bizarre when J.C. Price was named interim head coach. Um, I guess I get it. I don't get it. I'm confused, but I guess it makes sense. I know a lot of people want Justin Hamilton to get the big whistle. And you already mentioned the fact that Justin Hamilton probably wasn't ready to be a DC when he was hired as a DC. Um, He has done really impressive things this year. I have said on the drive, ESPN Blacksburg, Monday through Friday, four to six. You can find it on the ESPN Blacksburg app also. Uh, Yeah, that's right. Um, I have said on several occasions that I believe that Justin Hamilton will be a head coach at the Power Five level. Um, I think it's probably a good move to not give him the big whistle because here's the thing, right? If Justin Hamilton takes over as head coach for these next two games and absolutely falls flat on his face, which with all of the turmoil surrounding this program it is, is possible, right? Like it's not a far stretch to say that potentially Justin Hamilton could just fall flat on his face or J.C. Price. I mean, anyone, whoever takes over this could just absolutely fall down. Um, you probably set the trajectory of his career back mm-hmm. a decade mm-hmm. by naming him head coach having him go 0-2, you know, the team gets blown out, let's just say, against Miami and against UVA. Yep. You you set the trajectory of Justin Hamilton's career back a decade. Yeah, so that, that's I, a really good thought. That's a really I'm, good thought. I'm really actually kind of cool because, I mean, nothing against J.C. Price, but does anyone have J.C. Price on their short list to be head coach anywhere? No. 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 I think also, too – this shows and i and i think your point is well taken that's something i hadn't really thought about but i think this also goes to show you that justin hamilton is not and was not going to be a serious candidate for this head coaching opening whenever it opens right and i think what wit also wants to avoid is say the opposite of what you said happens say justin hamilton takes over and virginia tech beats miami by 20 and it goes out and blows out uva the entire fan base, because it's a very reactionary group we're dealing with here. Every yep. fan base, every fan base says, uh, they would say, "Hire Justin Hamilton, hire Justin Hamilton, hire Justin Hamilton as the head coach." Right? If Whit Babcock is set on not hiring Justin Hamilton as the head coach, and he's now under pressure, and he makes his next hire, and he ends up not being the guy, then it's Whit's ass on the line. Yep. Right. Yep. So you avoid all that, right? You avoid the Justin Hamilton thing in two different directions, the one you referred to and the one I just referred to, right? You you just avoid that at all costs. And J.C. Price comes in, and that's 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 a fine I, – I like the J.C. Price interim head coach because he's actually on the staff, right? He's not like an offense, offense for defense like analyst who's like kind of right. one foot in, one foot out, so to speak. He's not like an on-field coach. Price is an on-field coach. Right. This isn't like a Jerry Kill situation or um, I guess uh, John Tenuta would be the example for for 2021. Yeah. So that would be that would be that side of it is you're you got an on field coach that's been around the players on the field during the games all year. And I think that adds an element to it, too. 
Sure. Um, and it also allows a more collaborative approach to right where not that Justin Hamilton's this guy because he's not, and he's very well respected on the coaching staff. Everybody loves him. So mm-hmm. I, this, this might come out a little bit differently than I intend, but you don't have a situation where Justin Hamilton takes over and you know, he's like the, the de facto head coach. Like he's going to come in and like command the room. Not that JC price isn't, but my point being, it's like, you know, JC price isn't like the long-term answer. Whereas Justin Hamilton could be auditioning for a head coaching job, right? We're not worried about that with JC price. So wit avoids all that. And I, I think that's why he's elected to go this route. So let's make a list. Who's the next head coach at Virginia Tech? I'm getting, I'm getting a lot of Les Miles. Um, oh, God. Eric McLean. God, no. Eric McLean from the ACC Network just t- tweeted out Beamer, Healy, Chadwell, Freeze would be on his list. I, I, I like the Hugh Freeze idea. Um, here's what I will say. And, again, this isn't me digging at Justin Fuente. I think that the next head coach of Virginia Tech must be from the Power Five level. I I think I'm with you. Justin Fuente came from Memphis. Again, I I say these things all the time. So for those that listen to The Drive on ESPN Blacksburg, Monday through Friday, 4 to 6, uh, you can tune in on the ESPN Blacksburg app. Um, For those that listen, you've probably heard me say this. There's a reason why you coach and play at the Power Five level. There is a reason why you coach and play at the Group of Five level, and there's a reason why you coach and play at the Division Two and Division Three level, right? Sometimes you can get into the deep water, and we see it happen, and you can swim. And sometimes you can't. And I think that coaches that have had success at the power five level can continue to have success at the power five level and coaches that have success at the group of five level. Um, I can't, his name is I'm blanking on his name right now. Coached at Western Michigan. Now is at um, Minnesota. Oh, uh, row the boat. And why, boat. Can I think of his name. Oh my God. Oh my yeah. God. Med- but I mean, but, but my oh, point is, PJ Fleck. PJ Fleck. PJ Fleck. thank you. It's it's highly bad. successful at Western Michigan, right? But what has he done at Minnesota? Yeah, he's had one good season, but there's a big difference from coaching Mac football at Western Michigan right. and coaching Big Ten Power Five football at Minnesota. Same deal with Justin Fuente. Here's, had success at Memphis, right? Here's what I'll say. Yeah, go ahead. Here's what I'll say. I. I think, first of all, hiring a head football coach is a total crapshoot. Like, Justin Fuente is a prime example of that. He yep. was the hot coach yep. in that coaching carousel uh, going into 2016. He was the hot name, right? Takes over a Memphis program that was sputtering a bit, turns him around in three years. He was the hot head coaching candidate, just as Billy Napier is at Louisiana or Jamie Chadwell is at Coastal or, you know, name your group of five head coach. No two coaches are the same, right? No two coaches are the same, no matter if it's power five, group of five, what have you. And there's no true indicator of success, of guaranteed success, I'll say, between if you're coming from the group of five or the power five, what have you. Now, the one thing I will say is that hiring a guy with power five experience is the safer move Mm -hmm. it is the safer move now billy napier is a very popular name that's going to come up in this coaching carousel he may very well be the next head coach of virginia tech billy napier has an extensive resume where he's coached under several very good coaching staffs similar to how shane beamer did the difference between billy napier and shane beamer is that South Carolina valued Shane Beamer's assistant coaching experience everywhere he went in the Power Five and where he was coming from on OU staff enough to hire him at South Carolina over Billy Napier. Billy Napier was a candidate there, right? Napier's name's going to come up. I don't know if it's a good hire or not. Right. I think the resume the resume is fine. Louisiana is a good team. 
He's had success at the Group of Five level. The Athletic has said that there's mutual interest. That was, I think, Bruce Feldman wrote that article, said there's mutual interest between Napier and Virginia Tech if that job were to come open. Are we absolutely sure we're not hiring Fuente again? You're not, right? And I think Napier could be good in Blacksburg, just as I think Jamie Chadwell, Coastal Carolina's coach, could be good in Blacksburg. Are you absolutely sure you're not hiring Justin Fuente again? And I feel like if you make the move to fire Fuente and get in line with all these big-time candidates, you're swinging through for the fences here. There are a number of guys who have recently been head coaches or are current head coaches that I think would be interested in the Virginia Tech job that you could get to come to Blacksburg that while they may not be here for the long haul, they could get this thing fixed for the next guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, exactly. Uh, so exactly. think of it like Buzz Williams with the basketball program, right? We knew that Buzz Williams was a very good coach. We also knew that Buzz Williams was not going to be in Blacksburg forever. Like we knew that coming into it. So now we're in a position where Virginia Tech gets to hire their next head coach. There are some guys with some interesting coaching backgrounds and it, like head coaching backgrounds, guys who are no longer at their respective schools. There's Gary Patterson, who was just let go from TCU. There's Gus Malzahn, who's in the middle of a reclamation project of his image down at, at UCF after being let go from Auburn. And UCF's yep. banged up all year. They're putting together, they're fielding a competitive team, right? Right. There's Hugh Freeze at Liberty, who brings his own kind of baggage. But he's a candidate who knows Virginia. He's recruited Virginia. He understands the landscape at the state and is a more intriguing candidate than I think a lot of people are going to give credit to because of his checkered past at Ole Miss. Yep. And is he far? The question now is, is he far enough removed and can Witt get buy off from the donors to hire Hugh Freeze with his baggage? I think the answer to that is probably no, but I think he is a candidate, right? Yep. Sure. Yeah. Um, Scott sure. Mann says, in other words, before making this move, Witt better have had a short list of people who he knows who are willing to come here. Yeah. I, the answer is, yeah, he know, he has a short list. He's oh, probably right. already contacted these people. <laughs> like this has yeah. been, there are ways to do this with Fuente still, still the head coach. There, there's probably three people on Witt's list and Witt's on the phone right now talking to those three people. Right now, who is on Witt's list? Only Witt knows the answer to that question. But I can give you who I think is on Witt's list. I will tell you from very reliable sources that I have heard that Hugh Freeze is on Witt's list. Um, here's the problem. Dr. Sands has to sign off on, yeah. on the hire. And the question becomes, will he sign off on Hugh Freeze because of that checkered pass that you mentioned before? Right. I, I just, I'm not convinced the answer to that is yes. Yeah. And, and open to being wrong, I, I think Hugh Freeze would be an on-field coaching fit uh, for sure. And it would be a big time job for him. And it would be his way to break back into the coaching ranks. And look, he did some, he did some, <laughs> he did some stuff. He probably regrets at all miss, you know, Certainly. I mean, with, with his cell phone, with his cell phone and, you know, contact and call girls with a work phone, all that stuff. Right. But like, uh, we've seen worse, you know, like, the Art Bryles thing, for example, at Baylor, like covering up rape allegations, we have seen worse than than the Hugh Freeze situation at Ole Miss. You know, yeah. there's a reason why one guy's coaching and one guy's not anymore. One guy's been blacklisted, right? Yep. Like Hugh Freeze wasn't covering up rapes. Right. You know, right? It's it's a little bit. There, there are levels to it. There are yep. levels to it. Um, so, who do I think's on Wits list? Yeah, I think Hugh Freeze is on it. I just don't know how realistic it is. Billy Napier's absolutely on it. Mm -hmm. Jamie Chadwell, probably on it. Um, I also think there are guys that are probably outside of the box that not a lot of people are talking about. Marcus Freeman, defensive coordinator at Notre Dame, I think is probably on the list. How realistic it is that he comes here, we'll see. I think Fuente will call up Luke Fickle. I don't think it's that realistic considering where Cincinnati's at, but if they get, right. if they go undefeated and get snubbed from a bowl game, Fickle's going to sit here, evaluate the landscape, and say, can I really get to where I want to be here? Right. So that's going to be a question that he has. But I think he's in line for bigger jobs in Virginia Tech. But I think you got to make that call. Certainly. Um, there are other head coaches out there that I think you could potentially evaluate. You know, Dan Mullen is struggling at Florida. I don't know if you want to see what Dan Mullen's doing down there uh, and see if he would come to Blacksburg. But he's got no. He made it clear like 
he doesn't really care. He, he made comments this week to insinuate that he doesn't really care about recruiting, which if you're at Virginia Tech, you you got to figure that out. Andrew's here. Yeah. Hello. Who, who are your uh, who are your head coaching candidates? Like right off the top, Billy Napier. I just heard you guys talking about Hugh Freeze a little bit. That is an interesting one. Was the insinuation I didn't hear it fully that Freeze is on the list, but would it be Sands that needs to sign off on it? Yeah. 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 So ultimately, you know, we, we put all this on wit, but at the end of the day, Dr. Sands is the one that Dr. Sands has to approve the, the, the totality of the coaching hire. So wit can, wit can come to him and say, I want to hire this Satan guy to be the head coach. He's got a winning record, right. At fill in the school here. And if Dr. Sands is like, nah, we don't want Satan coaching us. Then Witt's got to move on to his next guy. Now, I'm assuming, and I feel like this is a very safe assumption to make, that Dr. Sands and Witt have already – we were talking about the list, right, Mike? I I would I would bet money that Witt and Dr. Sands have already met. They have the list, and there is an agreement that if, you know, one of these three to five guys is willing to come to Virginia Tech and coach – he'll sign off on them. Now, whether or not Hugh Freeze is still on that list, that I don't know. But I have been told by very reliable sources that Freeze actually might be, quote unquote, Wits guy. So here's one way that you have to look at it. Then. And I think Chris Coleman pointed this out to us maybe a year ago when they were contemplating firing Fuente at the time, is that you don't fire the coach unless you know that you have a short list of three to five candidates, yep. all of which you feel if you hired them would be an upgrade from you know your current situation. Otherwise, you're just firing someone for the sake of firing them. Right. At this point, the fact that this decision was made a couple weeks early, like you said, Paul, means that that list has been compiled and they're comfortable with their candidate pool as it is right now. So now with Fuente out of the picture, you know, I'm sure the buyout was negotiated to be not as much as it was if he was fired on the first day of the season, but probably not as much as the full December 15th buyout. You know what I mean? Like they're, that's not going to fully drop. They are spending an extra couple million dollars here to buy themselves some time to get in front of that candidate pool and make their decision. So, you know, flight tracker season is on my friends and it's going to be really interesting because Look for some flights from Lafayette, Louisiana, potentially Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Look for a limo coming in from Lynchburg. <laughs> it, it's going to be interesting. But uh, another thing I'm curious about here, is Cornelson still the offensive coordinator? Yes. Yep. That That is not, as far as we know, unless, unless he... So that would be an interesting thing, Mike. We just talked about Fuente's loyalty to Cornelson. Is that a two-way street? If you're Brad Cordelson, your boy just got fired. You walking out the door next to him? I mean, <laughs> I think at some point, I, I think at some point you owe you owe the kids when you're making it. Like if you're wet and you're making this this call, right? Right. You still owe it to the kids to try to make a bowl game to a degree. Even if you got to get kind of in line with the with the head coaching carousel, um, look. The only reason this decision was made today is because Fuente and Fuente's agent and Virginia Tech came to an agreement on a reduced buyout, right? And I that'll be released at some point, but that's got to be the reason this happened today. I, I can see no other plausible reason why Virginia Tech didn't wait until the fifteenth. And the mutual the mutual parting of ways, like there's a reason it was phrased like that, right? Like. They didn't fi they didn't fire him. That triggers the buyout. It was a mutual parting of ways for a reason. Yep. Yep. Back to your original point, like there you owe it to the kids to do right by them and have your coaching staff still be somewhat intact as you go out and play your remaining two games. Mm -hmm. So I that's why corn is still here, right? Like that's, that's why the rest of the staff still here, right? This was a Fuente decision and they know they're cleaning house after the year anyway, but right. you make the decision now because you get ahead of the early signing day and you, you were able to come to an agreement with this. This is the best case scenario for everybody. This best case scenario for everybody. Virginia Tech gets to have a head start on the coaching search. 
they agreed to something with Fuente, which we'll find out at some point. Wit will probably not get into that today, but we'll find out at some point, you know, what the details of that are. But they came to an agreement on the buyout, clearly. They mutually part ways. Virginia Tech can hire their new coach before the 15th and give them an opportunity to recruit some of the guys in this class and try again to stay. There's going to be turnover, but you can you can salvage the class a little bit by pulling the trigger now, which is why so many coaches, there, so many schools make changes to their coaches around this time of year. And Paul, honestly, on the uh, Cornelson question of of loyalty and all that, we're giving Justin Fuente a big lump sum of money to go away. Justin Fuente, because the coaching world is such a fraternity, will most likely end up maybe in an analyst role at a school like Alabama for a year before you know he's either a group of five a head coach or a FBS offensive coordinator. I don't know if Brad Cornelson is going to have that kind of uh, safety net in his in his job searches after this. He's making a nice lump sum of money here at Virginia Tech. If he were to just quit, he would be leaving you know tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table. So I think if I'm Brad Cornelson, I'm standing pat. And like Mike said, you know there needs to be some sort of continuity. Changing offensive coordinators with two games left in the season when you need to win one to make a bowl game. It just seems like it would stoke more chaos than it would create benefit for the Hokies. I agree. Yeah, I agree. All right. So we've been doing this for over 40 minutes. Uh, let's let's wrap this thing up. Um, Mike, tell the tell the people, because uh, we've had a bunch of people jump on. By the way, uh, like, subscribe, rate the Virginia Tech page. Um, we do stuff on here all the time. Uh, we broadcast the Hokie House pregame show on here. We want to get this thing built up. This is a great opportunity uh, we'll probably be on here quite a bit more over the course of the next few months as this coaching search thing breaks down and 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 breaking news happens. So this is a great place to find out what's going on and get our thoughts as as it happens. Mike, tell the people where they can find all of your stuff. I am guessing you'll have several articles out over the course of the next 24 to 48 hours on this. Where do they find you? Sunsofsaturday.com. Go check that out. Check out the Hokie Hangover podcast. We're going to be recording today after literally I'm, I'm going to release the podcast that we recorded last night, like right after this. So we have dated at this point, but <laughs> <we're out there. laughs> it's getting released. Who cares? We're just going to send it. I already edited it, so it's, it's got to go up. Uh, right, but yeah, yeah we're going to have a, a podcast recording on this basketball conference, the ACC football podcast, also outdated at this point. So uh, go check that out as well. Oh, man. What else? I think that's it. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Mike McDaniel SOS. All right. Andrew and I do the drive every Monday through Friday on ESPN Blacksburg. I might have mentioned that once or twice already here. Uh, you can find us on the ESPN Blacksburg app. Today, we're going to do buy or sell at the top of the show at 4 o'clock. I'm guessing that's going to be mostly hokey related. You probably yeah, want to. I was going to say, Paul, maybe we just do buy or sell a list of candidates. Yeah, I'm thinking so. Uh, Chris Coleman will join us, uh, and 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 among others, Mitch Tischler will be in to talk Washington football team today. So if you want to check out the drive, we encourage you to do so. Andrew, on the recruiting front, uh, you host a podcast with the guys from VT Scoop. Where do the listeners get that? Because I'm guessing y'all are going to have to probably record one or two of those in the next 48 hours, too. Yep, we got one scheduled for tonight, I believe at like 8 p.m., but yeah, inside the tunnel from VT Scoop 24-7 Sports. Uh, myself, Evan Watkins, Doug Bowman, Matasis. Uh, a lot of fun. We talk about the games. We talk about it from the recruiting end. And, uh, of course, now with everything having to be taken on the macro level and a, a good recruiting class that's, you know, in all likelihood, as Mike mentioned, probably going to see some attrition. That's what happens when uh, a coaching change is made. Players tend to commit to coaches over schools and programs that are led by Coach X. So it's going to be a tough task of the new head coaching administration, whoever they may be, to retain as many as they can. Because, uh, you know, Fuente got a lot of flack on the recruiting front over the years, especially the last, I think, two recruiting cycles. But 2022, things were looking up was able to recruit in the state of Virginia a little bit better, was able to make some inroads elsewhere. And now that's kind of all in the balance. So check it out inside the tunnel podcast brought to you by VT scoop 24 seven sports. I don't know about you guys, but I can't keep up with my, uh, my Twitter feed right now. It's just, it blows up. It blows up in tweets of like 20. I owe it to my place of employment to turn off Twitter for at least a half hour. 
<laughs> that sucks. Andrew, yeah. let's double down on our Twitter because this is what we do yes. for a living. Your screen time today was 17 hours. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's fair. Exactly. All right, boys. Uh, good program here. Uh, again, if you haven't already, like, subscribe, rate the Virginia Tech page on the Voice of College Football. Thanks to Mark Rogers for allowing us to do this on here. And I'm sure we'll be back on a regular basis over the course of the next few weeks, especially outside of our normal show times and and program times. So like, subscribe, rate, and uh, we will talk to you all soon, guys. Thanks for doing this.